Yes, you're good. Thank you. Great. Okay. All right. So again, welcome. Today we're talking about the Maternal and Pediatric Precision in Therapeutics Hub. And you know, very excited again for the first of what will hopefully be many, many meetings of this group. So I want to give a perspective from the NICHD, you know, what we're sort of thinking about as we put this together, expectations and how these things um, come together and can be managed. So I want to just kind of recap what the overall need is and the rationale was for moving forward with a very unique opportunity like the Mprint Hub. Um, you know, the Mprint Hub is a program that has a significant amount of resources from it. And we really intend programs like this to have a special function within the overall research endeavor within the country, and I would say even globally. I'll touch on the purpose and the objectives of the hub, again, at a very sort of high conceptual level, and I'll leave it to the, the PIs and a lot of the speakers today to dive into the more concrete objectives of what they're, what they're working on in their individual centers. And I also want to touch a little bit on the hub future, sort of the overall potential we see and how moving forward from this, you know, up coming up on the, the end of the first year for the hub, what it can look like in future years, as well as long term. And, you know, as Sarah mentioned, one of the things we really want to focus on for the Mprint Hub is interactions collabor and collaborations. And really thinking about how all the different puzzles come together in terms of advancing maternal and pediatric pharmacology and therapeutics, of which the Mprint Hub is one part, one that we hope continues to add pieces to itself. So before I dive in, I just want to introduce um, NICHD Mprint staff, program officers that oversee it. Again, I'm Aaron Pollack. Um, for those that have, have been joining as we've gone through our opening remarks, I'm Chief of the Obstetric and Pediatric Pharmacology and Therapeutics Branch here at the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. I also want to um, introduce Dr. Leslie Sandy Bates and Dr. Zasha Wren, who are the program officers for the Knowledge and Research Coordinating Center and the Centers of Excellence for Therapeutics, respectively. Um, and hopefully after my remarks, we'll have a little bit of time for question and they can both come on camera and we'll happy to field questions. What's not shown here um, at the NICHD is a lot of other people that make this possible. I definitely want to recognize all of the efforts of our grants management branch, which I know some of you interact with. Many of them are popping in and out today to see the science that they put a lot of work into supporting. And of course, you know, a lot of other staff that go into running an institute like the NICHD that make having a program officer role possible. So when I think about the need for the Mprint Hub, I, I go to this problem. Um, and really to state it, it's that physicians and patients must sometimes make decisions on medication and vaccine use, something we've seen in the last couple of years, uh, without having rigorous, rigorously conducted regulatory studies and approvals on which to guide those decision making. And I would say this put patients, caregivers, families, um, and physicians and healthcare providers, you know, in an in, in uncomfortable position in many times. Why does this problem exist? Um, you know, this paper is, is four years old, but I doubt the numbers have changed very much. Um, this was a, a paper from Dr. Uh, Bianchi that came out a few years ago looking at different trials on clinicaltrials.gov. So what this figure shows is the percentage of trials for groups that are typically underrepresented where that, that group is either excluded, included, or not stated. So for example, for pregnancy, lactation, um, and children, you can see there's very often an act of exclusion from clinical trials. Some studies where we have inclusion, um, we're actually doing better in children than we are in pregnant and lactating persons. Um, we'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, but I think we need, to do, we need to do a lot better here. And what's also interesting is if you look at these various underrepresented groups, and you know, there's a bit of an at, people can be in multiple groups at different times, about 60% of the US population are, are from are at certain point in their lives within groups that are underrepresented in research. So this, this, this is really something that we need to change so that we can have inclusive um, drug, dis drug development and really make sure that there are not any underrepresented groups and patients and physicians can make informed decisions. 
but why are especially pregnant people and children underrepresented in clinical trials? There are both real and perceived ethical concerns on inclusion. Um, certainly, I think there is also an ethical imperative to include individuals in clinical trial research as early as possible so that we can have data. We have to protect people through research, not from research. There are, again, real and perceived concerns on safety risks that we need to, we need to work to minimize. There are practical challenges to inclusion in clinical trials. Um, certainly one of those being a lack of a workforce which is experienced in these populations. And the MPRINT is a new initiative um, that continues the branch's efforts to provide knowledge, tools, and training to help address these factors. I just briefly want to uh, go back to NICHD's strategic plan that came out a few years ago. One of the five scientific themes was advancing safe and effective therapeutics um, for a variety of populations. Um, I do want to highlight that the NICHD on the extramural side has 12 extramural branches. We also have a Center for Medical Rehabilitation Research. Um, so theme five and advancing therapeutics certainly cuts across a lot of the research areas that the NICHD supports. Well, OPPTB is the main sponsor for the MPRINT Hub. We definitely recognize that there are a lot of therapeutic areas across NICHD and NIH that we support. Now, when you move forward with something like the MPRINT Hub, which has a lot of resources for it and a unique mission and a unique fit, and I would, you know, seeing it as a pivotal role in helping to coordinate maternal and pediatric um, therapeutic research in this country, um, the, sort, the, the, the support for that comes from a variety of different places. So I don't want to go through all the legislation on pediatric drug trials here, but I do want to highlight Two pieces of this. The Best Pharmaceuticals for Children Act, which is, a, which is a congressional mandate that provides for funding to support a variety of research conducted by the NIH in the off-patent space. This supports the Pediatric Trials Network and its current iteration, which conducts uh, labeling studies for pediatric indications for medications, and we'll be hearing from the Pediatric Trials Network later today in the Parade of Networks. Underneath that umbrella, the NIH also uses BPCA funds to support a variety of, of um, efforts through grants. Very, uh, training has been a traditional one for us, as well as focusing on therapeutics translational research, for which the MPRINT Hub is one of the activities supported by the BPCA. 21st Century Cures Act a few years ago uh, mandated that there is a task force on research specific to pregnant women and lactating women with a charge here to identify gaps in knowledge on research um, for effective therapies in these populations. Um, this, the PregLAC task force was a very, very large effort, multiple agencies, components of the NIH, as well as the private sector were involved. It was overseen by the NICHD. A couple of years ago, an implementation plan was submitted to the Secretary of HHS um, with a variety of, re variety of recommendations on what can be implemented. So another portion of the MPRINT Hub is supported by the NICHD to meet the PREGLAC implementation funds. So I just wanted to highlight here the two, two large uh, congressionally mandated efforts that go into supporting something like the MPRINT Hub. And as I was talking about, you know, the, the BPCA and that mandate has been viewed as a model for what PregLAC could do. Certainly, we've seen some success in the last couple decades in pediatrics, and we're a little bit behind in terms of research on women, uh, pregnant women and lactating women. So to get this a little bit more toward where we see the, what we see the imprint hub doing, you know, on the left here, there's a lot of basic research, therapeutic discovery conducted by the NIH, non-clinical development um, supported by the private sector, the NIH foundations, et cetera. We want to get here on the right to inclusive product development. And what I mean by inclusive product de development is having drug development or vaccine development that incorporates studies in all populations, pediatric, pregnant and lactating persons, as early as possible. Now, there's a gap, and you know, very often I think it is, it is um, really dedicated people that are willing to bridge that gap. What we need to do is really work on therapeutic science, uh, therapeutic research, and implementing um, this guidance and generating a lot of new tools 
that can help accelerate this. For example, pharmacometric modeling, getting better, better biomarkers, um, having aggregated knowledge, that's gonna really help us build a solid bridge to inclusive product development. I wanna highlight two other aspects of the NICHD strategic plan. Uh, there were a set of aspirational goals um, as well as main scientific themes. One is to facilitate the application of precision medicine. I, I very, um, you know, with my background, I often think of precision medicine from a pharmacogenomics perspective, but there are multiple aspects to precision medicine. I think having, uh, knowing precise dosage and safety across an entire human life cycle at whatever life stage, be it childhood, pregnancy, the postpartum period, et cetera, is an aspect of precision medicine, as well as using a variety of omics technologies and biomarkers to guide dosing. And training the next generation of scientists is another um, thing that the NICH needs is very committed to, um, especially thinking about how we can do that to build up our clinical pharmacology workforce. Um, and when I think of training the next generation of scientists, I always think, also think about workforce development and making sure that people stay along the pathway from training to becoming um, established scientists. So we get to a little bit more specifically about what we see as for the purpose of the Mprint Hub. So this was actually a very um, early slide that we were using to highlight how we see the Mprint Hub serving as a service center and a catalyst for science. And you can see here, when we think of a hub, we do think about this literally as a hub where it can communicate and interact with a lot of different classifications of groups. So as a hub, it can provide knowledge and expertise to the entire scientific community, really catalyze and accelerate maternal and pediatric therapeutics toward precision medicine. The Emprint Hub is certainly not going to be able to do everything. And what is a unique space, again, for a special program like this? I think focusing on tools that can catalyze the larger field is important. And to do that, it will need to synergize with other resources and networks. Again, we're gonna be talking about a lot of those um, at this meeting that we'll be presenting, and we want to make sure we think about how we can most effectively synergize with them. And part of that is building upon current efforts, the pediatric trials network that the branch supports, um, as well as prior efforts by the branch, and also thinking about how more broadly the imprint hub can work, break down silos, and work with different networks supported by the NICHD, NIH, private sector foundations, et cetera. To get a little bit more concrete on that, you know, we, we, the NICHD and the NIH supports a large number of clinical networks, which such as the Pediatric Trials Network, Maternal Fetal Medicine Unit Network, and Neonatal Research Network, which are both up for re recompetition, as well as the Impact Network. Uh, this is not a not exhaustive list, but just a few, just highlighting a few. These networks typically conduct uh, a lot of clinical research, very often drug trials, um, and produce a large amount of data and biospecimens from these studies. The NIH, the majority of the research the NIH supports is via investigator initiated grants, grant, grants which support a variety of different studies um, spanning basic research, formulations, uh, drug repurposing, et cetera. These types of networks produce data at different scales and data, data and knowledge are made available in different ways. So certainly a lot of this is within literature. There are raw data that's deposited, pharmacoepi studies and registries. A lot of these things take much more um, uh, mining and curation to get to a, what I would call a usable knowledge. Um, additionally, there are structured data and knowledge bases as well as and repositories such as the NICHD's data and the specimen hub, which have things put together in a little bit more of a organized way, organized way. So how do we take all of this and start to get to that catalysis, right? You know, how can we advance regulatory clinical trials in our space? One thing that we clearly heard, and this was three and a half years ago when we're, we're we were thinking about what needed to be done and what eventually became the Mprint Hub um, was we really need a centralized maternal and pediatric pharmacology not knowledge base so that people could go to and pull knowledge out from a common framework that has a ontology that maps across diseases and a variety of different factors. Um, additionally, once you have a framework like that, you can identify knowledge gaps. Well, what are what are, what is something that we don't know that if we were to net to fill that knowledge in, 
would really help move things forward. Additionally, we would need a variety of tools to help facilitate drug development, such as biomarkers, better outcome measures, or heart, heart outcomes, technologies, pharmacometric modeling, et cetera. Um, and you can see this sort of starts to map to the Knowledge and Research Coordinating Center and this to the Centers of Excellence in Therapeutics. Cross-cutting all of this is education, training, and outreach, which needs to, needs to occur at all levels in these efforts. So we've essentially view the Emprint Hub as being something which can help all of these different groups communicate, leverage the knowledge, get it to our clinical networks, to the investigator-initiated grants, and also take that, feed it back in, and enhance the overall knowledge. I'm not going to read through this in detail. I just, whenever, uh, I think it's always useful to look back and see some of the language of what the hub objectives were from the actual RFAs when they were published. So you can see this sort of summarizes what I just described. Um, one thing I do want to point out um, here was the fact that the Emprint Hub was intended to oversee a opportunity pool of funds, also a support pool of funds through the CITs, which was intended to be a dynamic way to help facilitate collaboration and get novel projects off the ground. So the way we envisioned the Emprint Hub was to have a the, the main center component of the hub being the Knowledge and Research Coordinating Center funded by a programmatic P30 mechanism. These are our program project mechanisms which have more oversight than typical, um, as well as conducting knowledge aggregation and dissemination, providing the overall administrative and technical glue for the entire Mprint hub. As slight spokes off the hub, we envisioned the centers of excellence in therapeutics, which would fill in knowledge gaps and by conducting novel clinical translational basic and or data sciences research. And as you, I'm not gonna steal the thunder of the projects and I wouldn't do them as justice as the PIs, but we'll be hearing um, later this afternoon from all of them about exactly what's going on specifically now that we have awards given and, and um, people, that can, people that can start diving in and accomplishing the goals of the Mprint Hub. I also want to talk about one additional spoke to the Mprint Hub that we were able to add very early on, and that was a collaboration with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So leveraging and synergizing on the investments that the NICHD has put into the Mprint Hub, um, as well as the outreach of the Fogar Fogarty International Center in terms of bringing in and advertising expertise from investigators that support globally low and middle income countries, as well as the Bill and Melinda Gates program and its virtual pregnancy program, which focuses on in silico resources for PVPK modeling, again, to, to support um, safe and effective therapeutics in low and middle income countries. And we'll actually be hearing a talk from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So we have a Postdoctoral fellow funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Dr. Amaze, who is has a project um, to develop PPK models that incorporate disease relevant changes in maternal fetal physiology in West African populations throughout gestation. So this is a very exciting um, early early way that we got to see the Emprint Hub actually starting to expand its reach. Now that we have the awardees to the Emprint Hub funded, um, you know, these are again some specific objectives. I'm not going to read through this, but I just want to start to highlight some more specific. I was talking very general about what the Emprint Hub could be doing. Um, and you can see there's, you know, we're, we're starting to move forward to looking at a variety of different specific tasks that can help identify, um, help, help fill in these knowledge gaps and provide tools. And again, you know, the one of the main reasons to do something unique and special like the Emprint Hub is to produce tools and resources which can accelerate a lot of different efforts. So a different way to view the Emprint Hub is thinking about it as being a bustling marketplace, right? We want a lot of people in there looking at the different types of tools, the different knowledge, different queries, um, and bringing a lot of different and diverse perspectives and questions to what the Emprint Hub can do. So. This, this is really sort of our, our goal for the Emprint Hub, is it really being a, a central resource in the country and globally for 
for tools and resources that can advance maternal and pediatric research. So how do we make sure that we have a, a bustling and busy marketplace like that? Well, one thing to do is, you know, looking at the, the participants number for today, you know, we're starting to see people coming in and looking at the different things that the Imprint Hub has um, and what it can do. So that gets to also organize, organization and management. Certainly the Imprint Hub can't do everything um, and we need to think about what our priorities are, what are the most important things we can do. Um, attending this meeting are a set of subject matter experts selected by the NICHD that will be helping us to review the first year of the Imprint Hub. The Imprint Hub also has a set of external advisors. And not, not to go deep into the governance of the Hub, um, but there's a steering committee that provides general oversight with input from the NICHD and our subject matter experts. And, negotiate, and every year, the NICHD and the Imprint Hub awardees are going to you know, sit down and reprioritize and think how we can make the Imprint Hub of most value to the community. And that is one of the purposes of this meeting today is to have the parade of networks talk about different resources, what can come into the Imprint Hub and how can the Imprint Hub um, provide value to the broad investigator community. You know, I mentioned I want to talk about an upcoming Imprint opportunity. Um, you know, certainly we as we think about what more needs to be done, one thing that we developed was a, um, the idea of bringing in a translational research resource platform to the overall endpoint program. So this is a notice of intent to publish. Um, if anybody's interested, you can, you can Google this and um, take a closer look. The overall objectives of the translational research resource platform are is focused on getting toward biomarkers. So really getting moving along the pathway to qualified biomarkers. That of course takes a variety of steps in there and depending on the status of a particular field or disease, um, the entry point for that may differ. This schematically, I want to want to show a little bit more what I'm talking about. Um, going back to a variety of large networks, data registries, literature, et cetera. Um, a lot of these produce biosamples and data. So we do, we do envision the translational research resource platform as being something which can take a lot of this data, biosamples, et cetera, and through conducting biomarker focused research, um, start, to get, start to address some gaps in translational research. So potential goals for this platform, um, you know, really could be assembling multi-study multi -study biosample and data collections, providing common lab platforms to work on those biosamples to get toward biomarker discovery, validation, and or qualification. Um, start to work on high priority questions. And again, working with the community, very much an imprint hub spirit to identify key questions and then identify and fill gaps in biosamples. So we do envision this translational platform working very closely with the Mprint Hub to help facilitate investigator-initiated grants, working on collaborative projects, and especially in the biomarker space, really thinking about the potential for public-private partnerships. Um, and you'll actually be hearing a talk later today on the foundation for the NIH and its biomarker consortium um, and how the NIH and the FNIH can help um, advanced biomarkers that can then be used in the drug development process, both in the academic world as well as in the private sector. And lastly, I just want to say again, you know, that as I've said, the Imprint Hub, it's it's something unique. It comes from a it it's supported basically by uh, two congressional mandates. You know, we do intend there to be unique things that the Imprint Hub does. Um, but we're building the bridge as we cross it. You know, we this is whenever you start working on something new, you're, you're, it's not necessarily clear exactly how it can be most of most value. So going back to that bridge analogy from earlier on, we're still trying to figure out exactly what that bridge can look like. And again, this is why we um, are seeking a lot of input through this meeting, really trying to show what the capabilities can be, and collectively really think about how we can make an effective bridge toward inclusive product development. And with that, I think we are doing okay on time. I'd be happy to take um, any other, any questions and um, Leslie and Zasha can also chime in on anything that I may have missed. And thank you all for listening.
Audrey? Hi, Erin. It's Audrey Tremblay from UC San Diego. Just in um, reference to that RFA, first of all, thank you for sharing that opportunity as well as the, the pictorial representation. I just wanted to kind of get maybe some clarity on that. You talked about uh, biomarkers and then you show the resource platform kind of going through like kind of um, serving as a bridge to all these networks. So I was just wondering if you could just maybe clarify for us, is it that the goal is to be able to work with all these networks and understand the breadth of biomarkers that are being used and kind of bring that together? I just wasn't sure how quite that all fits with the RFA. Uh, yeah, thanks, great question. Yeah, it, and from graphically, I, I, I can see how it might have been implied that the intent was to work with all of those networks. It was more that um, what we do is want to leverage collections from some of those networks to answer specific questions, right? Again, you know, we, keep, we can't do everything, but, I, you know, if there are two networks that have biosamples and data that could then be focused to work toward a biomarker for one therapeutic indication, that would be the type of thing that we would we would sort of expect. I think, um, you know, working with all of the networks is is likely not a not a reality not not possible. Thank you. All right, I am not seeing any oh, other. Can I oh, ask a sorry. question? I can't figure out how to get the hand raise thing. <laughs> That's fine, um, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you could um, expand a little on the collaboration um, and and how, how that would work. Like, are these Thanks. studies that are being done, there's access to um, remaining samples or is this more, the goal internally within the network is to do biomarker studies and that's sort of an internal investigation. Yeah, so if, if I understood the question, so we're, the, what we're thinking of for the, for the RFA is one, it's, it, 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 it's open to a few different approaches. The overall theme is, getting, is, is starting to advance through biomarkers. Um, I would say that there are a large number of biosamples and data that are underutilized um, that I think could be pulled together into collections to start to, you know, in an ideal world, we want to want to get to qualified biomarkers that might be might not be realistic in the first first iteration of some of this. So I think taking taking in those available biosamples, there may be additional prospective recruitment. Or, or prospective sample collection for studies that are ongoing in the future, um, you know. But what applications that are going to are going to need to be responsive to this RFA are going to have to be involved in either discovery, validation, or qualification of biomarkers. Did, did that answer your question enough? Sorry, and, and for, for that, we you would be able to sort of apply for existing biomarkers, or it would be for prospective development of a sample of, of a biorepository. Yeah, so we do we do envision folks. Yeah, a, a lot of different approaches could be taken. You know, I think coming in with existing bio existing biobanks and samples would be acceptable. Um, and getting, you know, exactly, well, keeping a look on the time, it might be good to take, to have some uh, offline conversations where we could talk a little bit more specifically about what you're thinking for a particular application. Early. Hey, Aaron, um, in your little diagram, you sort of had a kind of overarching, um, theme of interacting with the CETs and the KRCC, are you 
envisioning that this um, translational platform would be like an overarching kind of like a KRCC, but for biomarkers? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, in terms of exactly how this would fit into the imprint hub, will depend a little bit on the applications that come in and and end up getting um, funded as awards. It wasn't I don't think we've been viewing it as a nest as more like a KRCC, but more in the CET vein, where these would be projects that would be associated with the imprint hub and program, for, you know, working to produce tools and resources that could hopefully be advertised through the imprint hub, right? So it's more of a feed in in that perspective. And then depending on the stage and the actual approaches taken, um, you know, they may interface more with a CET, they may be a little bit more independent, they may align more with the KRCC, but we'll need to see what the competitive applications are. Thank you. And definitely just so we, we did get a few questions on that, you know, please do take a look at the RFA uh, or the, the notice of intent to publish and do reach out to us with specific with more specific questions where then we can speak a little bit more you know, one on one about what specific ideas individuals may be thinking about for potential applications for that to enhance the overall imprint program. I'm not seeing any other hands. So Sarah, shall we, um, we've got a few minutes. Shall we get a, a jump on the next set of presentations? I think you're on, you're on mute, Sarah. Yep. I'm uh, sorry. I was trying to to unmute, um, find the right spot. So yes, we can go ahead and, and start um, talking about the, the DMKRCC. So let me 